speech was not protected if it is false. It has to be true in order to be protected. Um, and the court said that's inconsistent with the way our system, our First Amendment system works, where we have this robust marketplace of ideas, hurly-burly, uh, noisy, disorderly marketplace of ideas, uh, where some false speech is going to be uttered in it, and it shouldn't lose its protection simply because it turns out not to be true. Um, and the court uh, quotes Justice Brandeis in the Whitney versus California, the great opinion from 1927, about the very purposes of free speech, uh, and that we all have uh, the right, if not the duty, as citizens, to pipe up and be heard on the issues of the day, including to criticize government and so on, not always in a polite way. Probably the most often quoted uh, part of the Sullivan decision is where Brennan says that we consider this case against the background of a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. Um, in other words, he's saying that error is inevitable in the rough and tumble of public debate. And in order for there be, to be sufficient breathing space, using that term, um, some false speech has to be tolerated. Otherwise, there will be a chilling effect, a concept that has become a cliche, really, in First Amendment cases, that speech will be chilled. There will be a chilling effect if false speech, simply because it's false, is outlawed. Um, the press, for example, he says, will steer clear of the prohibited zone. Stay away from saying anything that might turn out to be false because you're going to get hammered, you're going to get sued, which is enormously expensive and distracting to begin with, and you might get hit with a big verdict, like the one that Sullivan got, by saying something that you think is true, but you don't have ironclad proof of it, so you don't go with it. You don't publish it. And when publishers or would-be speakers, individuals, decide to steer clear of the prohibited zone, a lot of speech that actually is true will never get heard by the people because it won't, they can't take the risk of publishing something that turns out to be false. Um, some true speech inevitably will not be published, and that's especially true, Justice Brennan points out, where the burden of proving truth is on the speaker, on the publisher, rather than the burden of proving falsity um, being on the plaintiff, the one who's complaining. So the conclusion is that um, that the publication is false is not a sufficient reason to deprive a statement of First Amendment protection. Simply that it's false doesn't mean that it's unprotected. Tuck that away for the discussion of Alvarez on the liar case on Thursday. Um, then, well, what about the fact that not only is a libel false, but it's defamatory. It injures somebody in their reputation. Doesn't that deprive the speech of First Amendment protection? And Justice Brennan says, no, that doesn't either. Remember, what we're talking about here is the criticism of public officials, the very heart of the First Amendment. And Justice Brennan goes back and reviews the history and uh, declares that under our First Amendment, there is no such thing as seditious libel. That is, libel on government. Government can't be libeled. Um, and the court has never recognized um, that libel on government would be a valid claim. Justice Brennan, in considering this subject, goes back to James Madison and the Madisonian premise of our government, which is that we the people are the sovereigns here, not the government. We the people are in charge here. Uh, and we all have, as Madison said, the right of freely examining public characters and measures. This is the only effective guardian of every other right. Madison said that in the Virginia resolutions, which he went back to Virginia for and got passed by the Virginia legislature in response to the Sedition Act of 1798, which um, Madison, architect of the First Amendment, viewed as completely inconsistent with the First Amendment. So he, he went off to Virginia, Thomas Jefferson went off to Kentucky, I think it was, and they tried to stir up state uh, opposition to the uh, Sedition Act. And the Virginia resolutions that Madison wrote are an eloquent defense of the right of the press and the people to criticize government. And here Brennan again works in Brandeis's uh, Whitney opinion about the duty that citizens have to criticize government. Not just the right, but the duty to criticize government. That's what we ought to do to be good citizens. Uh, so Brennan concludes that neither falsity nor defamation, injuring somebody in their reputation, deprives speech of First Amendment protection. Ah, what then about the combination of the two, both false and defamatory? And Brennan concludes that the combination fails as well. That's the lesson that we learned from the episode of the Sedition Act of 1798 uh, in our history, where we call the Sedition Act made it a crime to publish false, scandalous, malicious uh, material about the president or either House of Congress and so on. Uh, and while the Sedition Act itself was never considered by the Supreme Court, it expired in 1801, Jefferson pardoned all of the editors who had been convicted under it, Congress compensated their families, there, be, there became a national consensus that the Sedition Act was inconsistent with our First Amendment values, um, and, the, and Justice Brennan says the court, although the case never came here, um, the, the attack on the act, quote, carried the day in the court of history. And so the Supreme Court basically pronounces the Sedition Act unconstitutional 164 years after it had expired. Um, and the, uh, Justice Brennan said that the Alabama law, as applied in the Sullivan case, was too much like what happened under the Sedition Act. That is, that it stifled criticism of public officials, how they perform their official duties. That the Alabama common law of libel was applied in the Sullivan context really was no different from the effect of the Sedition Act in stifling criticism of government officials.
Um, and that violates, Justice Brandon said, the central meaning of the First Amendment, which is the right that we all have to criticize government. Um, and this is great stuff. In some respects, the Alabama common law, as applied in Sullivan, was worse, more dangerous to speech than the Sedition Act itself. Um, for example, um, the Sedition Act is a criminal law, which, as in all criminal laws, requires the prosecution to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a very strict standard of proof. Whereas in a civil case, a libel case like Sullivan's, all the plaintiff has to do is convince the trier of fact, the jury, by a preponderance of the evidence. Not beyond a reasonable doubt, but only by a preponderance of the evidence. Imagine in your mind a scale of justice, and if the scale on this side tilts just a little bit down, that's a preponderance of the evidence. More likely than not, that that's the fact. Uh, and so that's more dangerous to free speech if the person complaining about libel doesn't have to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Nor is there, in a non-criminal case like Sullivan's, a double jeopardy protection. Double jeopardy under the Federal Bill of Rights. You can't twice be put in jeopardy of life or limb, um, so they can't be tried twice for the same crime. That's what it amounts to. You can't be punished twice for the same act. That's double jeopardy. But in, in the civil situation, like Sullivan's, there's no double jeopardy protection. And in fact, the Times was sued multiple times, I think four times, uh, based on the very same ad. The governor of the state of Alabama also sued. And there's this pipeline of libel judgments uh, lined up behind Sullivan. Multiple punishments for the very same ad. So that the Alabama common law is more dangerous to free speech than the Sedition Act in that way. And finally, it's more dangerous because there's no limit on the amount of damages that libel plaintiffs can claim and receive. Sullivan just picked out of the air $500,000 and the jury gave it to him. Could have been a million, could have been five million. No limit on it at all. And in fact, at the time, Alabama, like many states, recognized a criminal libel uh, possibility that somebody could be prosecuted for criminal libel. And the law provided for a fine if you're convicted of criminal libel. But the judgment in Sullivan uh, was 1,000 times greater than the maximum fine that, he, that the criminal libel could have carried. So there were these terrorizing effects of the uh, common law of libel as interpreted in Alabama that were, in fact, more serious infringements of speech than the Sedition Act itself. That's what the court found wrong in a general way with the Alabama common law as interpreted in Sullivan. Test of truth, inconsistency with the Sedition Act. Um, and then you have to realize that the justices rejected the attempt by the state of Alabama and the segregationists in the South to use libel law as a political tool. It was perfectly clear uh, what Alabama and the Southern segregationists were up to here. They were trying to drive out reporting by the Northern press of the civil rights movement that was threatening their way of life. And I believe that the justices found that notion intolerable, practically and politically intolerable, uh, and felt the need to do something about it. Only one justice, in his opinion, recognized that explicitly and said so. And that was Justice uh, Hugo Black, who had been, was from Alabama, was a trial lawyer from Alabama, uh, and had been a senator from Alabama, and he didn't mince words about it. He knew what was going on here and said so. So those are the general reasons, I think, why the court found the common law wanting in Alabama and therefore found it necessary to impose First Amendment limits on liability for defamation. It had to be constitutional limits because otherwise it's simply a state law issue. Then let's look specifically at what the court found wrong with the common law of libel as applied in the Sullivan context. One obvious thing was the way Alabama treated the oven concerning issue, that the statement about a government agency is the same thing as a statement about the official in charge, satisfying the oven concerning requirement. That, Justice Brennan reasoned, is essentially allowing libel on government. You can't say, oh, well, there's no libel, there's no seditious libel, there's no libel on government allowed, and then at the same time say, but if you make a statement that's critical of a government agency, that's libelous, that's defamatory of the official in charge. Um, I don't know that the court would have come out differently uh, if the ad had actually named Sullivan. If it was perfectly clear uh, that, the art that the ad was about Sullivan, I'm not sure that the court would have come out differently because you've got the same theoretical, philosophical, historical reasons supporting criticism of government officials, even if they're named. Um, I think secondly, what the court, I know secondly, what the uh, court found wanting with the Alabama common law was the presumption of falsity with the burden on the defendant to prove the truth. Um, and again, I don't know that the court would have come out differently if the burden had been on Sullivan to prove falsity. Um, may not, the court may have come out the same way for the same reasons that we're still talking about criticizing government officials. Um, but placing the burden in this test of truth, placing the burden on the speaker or the publisher, um, caught the court's attention. And finally, what was wanting in the common law, not just of Alabama, but every place, was a requirement of fault. That since error is inevitable in public debate, in order to be held liable, the publisher ought to be in some sense blameworthy to have done something other than made a mistake. And that strict liability, liability without fault, was inappropriate, at least in the context of criticism of government officials. So what do we do about this? You, ex you expect Justice Brennan at this point in the opinion to say, and therefore, there can be no libel suits by public officials uh, in which they're complaining about an inaccurate description of how they perform their public duties. That is, libel's not permitted. a libel suit is not permitted by a public official if what he's complaining about is criticism of how he performs his duty. Um, but that isn't where Brennan went. 
he, he goes through all this reasoning about the Sedition Act and the test of truth and all this, and it's wonderful, and it's a great ride, and you're about to hear that conclusion and wait for the other shoe to drop. And instead, at the last minute, Brennan takes a detour and announces the actual malice rule. Instead of saying no libel suits by public officials, the court holds that now we have a federal First Amendment rule that a public official may not recover damages for a defamatory falsehood relating to his official conduct unless he or she proves a false statement of fact. The burden of proof now is on the plaintiff, the person alleging discrimination. The court has shifted the burden on truth and falsity to the plaintiff unless the plaintiff proves that a false statement was made with actual malice. And then the court defines actual malice in a very unusual way. It doesn't, the court's definition doesn't relate to malice as we normally think about it. That somebody acted maliciously, mean, evil, wanting to hurt somebody. That isn't what the court defined actual malice to mean at all. Um, rather, what actual malice means, according to New York Times versus Sullivan, is publishing knowing that what you say is false or, or acting with reckless disregard for the truth or the falsity of what you say. It's not both. It's either you knew it was false or you acted recklessly uh, in publishing, not caring whether it was true or false. Uh, and it was a very unfortunate term that Justice Brennan chose to use, malice, because it's very confusing and confuses everybody who hears it, at least for the first time, because it isn't malice as we normally think about it and talk about it. It's uh, the attitude of the defendant, not about the plaintiff wanting to hurt, injure the plaintiff. It's the attitude of the publisher about the truth. What did you know about the truth when you published it? Or did you care whether it was true or false? So what comes out of Sullivan is the rule is the actual malice rule, plus a First Amendment constitutional um, requirement with regard to the oven concerning um, common law element that an impersonal attack on a government agency cannot constitutionally be deemed to be a libel of the official in charge. Dealt with the oven concerning um, wrinkle that the Alabama Supreme Court had put on the law that way. That seems to have been a one-shot operation. That issue, to my knowledge, has not come back before the court at all. Lots of cases have come back with regard to whether something is going to be considered actual malice. And the court has come around, I think, to the point nowadays where they won't use the term actual malice. They use the term constitutional fault to mean what Brennan said and Sullivan was actual malice, constitutional fault. There has to be some fault in a libel case. The degree of fault is dictated by the Constitution. And at least with regard to public officials, the fault must be publication with knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. This new rule introduced then, constitutionalized every libel case. Every libel case is now First Amendment case in which the person suing has to make his or her case as a matter of common law and satisfy the First Amendment requirements. What requirements they have to satisfy is dictated first by the status of the plaintiff. If the plaintiff is, as in Sullivan, a public official, he has to prove constitutional fault, actual malice. Well, um, most people are not public officials. What happens to them? Um, well, the, um, the court had to deal with that not long after Sullivan. Uh, three years after Sullivan, the court decided two cases, one involving Wally Butts, who was a football coach at the University of Alabama and a very prominent figure in the community, and the other involved a Colonel Walker from Louisiana, who done something or other in Vietnam and so on, and become a public, publicly prominent person um, in uh, Louisiana. And they both independently brought, brought libel suits, uh, and their cases went to the Supreme Court of the United States, where the court had to consider what to do about individuals who are enormously powerful in our society, but don't happen to be public figures. I mean, think these days, who would, you know, gee, um, Oprah, Mark Zuckerberg, um, Sarah Palin, Rupert Murdoch.